Steering is hard. Two tons of steel has a lot of inertia. That's why the Jaguar originally came with this gigantic steering wheel, and why the steering ratio was set up so that you had to turn the wheel many more times than a modern car to go around the same corner. Power steering fixes this problem, but power steering on an electric swapped car is a little more complicated than you might think. Basically all cars have power steering these days, so it's perhaps a little odd that three of my four cars don't. The Honda never had power steering and never needed it since it's basically a motorcycle on four wheels. It's super light. The Jag also doesn't have power steering, and by that I mean it didn't have power steering until just a few days ago. I like to solve a lot of design problems with laser cut parts. I did this with my custom uprights. I did it with the motor mounting and the frame reinforcement in the rear. I did it with some of the suspension mounts. My problem with laser cut parts is that most shops don't even want to talk to you unless you're spending at least $500 and then they take their time getting their parts to you. But then I found sendcutsend.com. These guys are awesome. Super quick turnaround, accurate parts, great prices, tons of material choices, and instant quotes. I like these guys so much that I asked them if they wanted to be a super fast Matt sponsor. And they said, uh, yeah, obviously. This is a great video for them to sponsor because I needed an accurate, low cost, one off part to get my steering wheel in the exact right spot. And Send Cut Send was the perfect solution for this. I uploaded the drawing, picked my material and thickness, got an instant quote, and I had my parts in my hand a few days later. So if you're building your own suspension parts or you just need a flange or tab or something, go check out sendcutsend.com. For decades, the power for power steering came from hydraulic pressure. That pressure was created with a pump connected to the crankshaft of an internal combustion engine. Some cars were designed with power steering that got its hydraulic pressure from a pump powered by an electric motor. This is called electrohydraulic power steering. The Toyota MR2 had it after the first generation because it was easier than running hydraulic lines from the rear of the car where the engine is to the front of the car. Most modern cars skip the hydraulic middleman and stick the electric motor right on the steering rack. Not always the rack, sometimes the motor goes on the column. Tesla powers the rack. This is what it looks like on the Model 3 with this big bulge here being the electric motor. It's not a Tuma. Most of these electrically powered racks take in data from the car and adjust the amount of assist they give based on vehicle speed and inputs from the stability control system. Some of them will straight up drive the car without any input from the steering wheel. Steer by wire is the next evolution of this. This is a pretty cool setup. You have the steering wheel connected to a sensor and a force feedback motor. Then you have a bundle of wires going to the steering rack where you have a motor that steers the car. These cars will have redundant systems. The steering wheel will have two torque sensors, two feedback motors, two control systems, and two separate bundles of wires going to the rack. The rack will have one motor, but the motor will have alternating windings, so every odd winding is powered by the primary system and every even winding is powered by the secondary system. You know, cool thought, as soon as these things start hitting the junkyard, someone's going to figure out how to hack the controls and turn it into the most badass PlayStation controller. The power steering system that I'm using is from a Toyota Prius, which has the power assist motor on the column. And yes, it may seem odd to use a Prius part on a hot rod build, but it's actually pretty common. It's common because it's super easy. You get rid of all the pumps and lines from a hydraulic system, you hide the assist motor under the dash, give it 12 volts, and you're done. The Prius rack can take in CAN bus messages and adjust its level of assist, but you don't have to give it anything except 12 volts for it to work. You power it on, it looks for signals for a few seconds, and when it doesn't see any, it goes into a fail-safe mode and gives you the same assist it would if you were driving 43 miles per hour. There are a lot of other cars with powered columns, but the one from the Prius doesn't require any additional electronics or spoofed CAN messages. That's why it's so common to use for hot rodding, and why I'm using it. Most of the time when people use this, they retain the tilt function and just mount their steering wheel directly to the Prius column. It didn't seem like this would work for me because I don't have a whole lot of space under the dash. This whole Tesla pedal assembly is in the way. I might be able to rotate the motor into a different orientation, but to figure that out, I need to disassemble the entire dash. You know how with a lot of YouTube videos, people will spend two minutes talking and then just have like five minutes of them turning a wrench? No actual info, just watch me turn this wrench or look at me use a screwdriver. Like you don't know how a screwdriver works. Don't you hate that? They're just filling up time, trying to get their videos longer so they can upload more content and fool the algorithm. What kind of a person would do that? Fill several minutes of a video 
just to gain favor with the algorithm, all hail the algorithm. Certainly not me. Okay, we get the dash off. Interesting looking dash. They have all these wires coming off the back connected through these terminals. Without the wood on here, this thing kind of looks like that guy from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Anyway, it doesn't look like this will fit. I could make it work, but I'd have to do a pretty big tear up of the structure that holds the dash together, and I don't really want to do that. The other alternative is to stick it on the input of the rack, but there's not really anywhere to mount it. It would just be floating in the air, and then I'd have to make a bunch of weird structure to hold it there. I was considering this solution when it occurred to me that I don't actually need the tilting portion of the column, or even to mount the steering wheel to it. I just need the powered part. If I hacked off this part, then I could package the rest of it a lot easier. This still wouldn't work under the dash, mostly because the brake booster is kind of right where the steering wants to come out of the firewall. Wait, the firewall? That's it. I can mount the power mechanism directly to the firewall. It's a rigid structure right in line with the steering shaft. But how do I mount it to the firewall? It does have these bolt holes on the back where the original mounts went. This would be a good idea, except that I have to mount it on the outside of the firewall, so this would have to be backward with the input being the output and the output being the input. Will this work? Let's think about it. Normally we put a torque on the steering wheel and there is some resistance at the other side from the tires. The power mechanism sees this torque and helps us turn the direction we want to turn. If we flip it around backward, we put a torque on the output, what happens? Well, the input would resist the turn because of the friction of the tires, and the power assist would assist the tire side, which would power the steering in the opposite direction we want to go. So this would be like inverse power steering, making it much harder to steer than if you had no power steering at all. So no, it won't work that way. I have to mount this side to the firewall. To do that, I can clamp onto it with some sort of clamp that has a flange on it. This probably doesn't exist in exactly the way I want it to, but I do own a welder, so that's not really a problem. The sleeve right here is almost exactly 1.5 inches. I thought this was a little weird since it should be metric, but 1.5 inches is almost exactly 38 millimeters. Some of you non-Americans are wondering why this matters. Well, when you're fabricating something in the United States, it's almost always easier to get fractional fasteners and materials. Go to the hardware store and all the tubing, the sheet metal, adapters, most of the fasteners, and basically everything you need to build something is in fractions of an inch. So when you say, I hate fractions, use metric like the rest of the world, rest assured that I also hate the imperial system probably more than you do, but it's just easier this way. So anyway, 1.5 inches is a good size because that will make it easier to fabricate something. All I need is a long clamp with an ID of 1.5 inches, like this one. 40 bucks, I'll take that. Then I need a flange to weld it onto. I'm gonna make this out of a laser cut piece of steel. To do this, I 3D scanned both the brake booster and the powered firewall. Then I pulled in the scans to CAD and arranged them super close together. From that, I could design a flat plate that sandwiched between the brake booster and the firewall and also extends out to clamp onto the column. I uploaded the drawings to Send, Cut, Send on Friday and had the parts in my hand on Tuesday. This is a great part for laser because it's a somewhat odd shape, I need accurate dimensions, and I don't feel like spending an afternoon jigsawing and drilling out 12 different shapes. All I need to do now is weld it together. A quick tack weld to test fit. And then we put it on the car. Oh, I gotta drill a hole. Bonk. Oh my god, look at that fit. It's so perfect. With the bracket on, we'll mark the holes so we can put the bolts in there. These bolts are probably not entirely needed, but they'll be good to make sure that this is all rigid to the firewall. I'm gonna use rivet nuts on these holes. This car had a ton of blind fasteners where you had to have one person inside the car with a wrench and another outside to take things apart. This was made easier for me with the battery tray having a giant hole in it. I could just reach in to both sides. But I've patched that up now, so I'm going to use rivet nuts. If you haven't used rivet nuts, you should seriously consider checking them out. They're really great for bolting to sheet metal where you don't have easy access to the other side. There are two types of tools to insert them. This clampy thing is good for the smaller ones. 
These things are great for the larger ones. Just put the bolt through, screw the rivet nut on, and then twist the smaller hex while holding the larger hex. These two hexes have ramp angles cut into them that push the two pieces apart and mushrooms out the rivet nut. This mushroom part presses against the sheet metal and holds the rivet nut in. They're not as strong as a grade 8 nut and bolt, so if you're doing something safety critical, you'll need to buy the good ones and verify the strength capability of them. Since it all fits, I'll just fully weld the parts together. Give them a couple coats of paint and install it all together. Now that it's all in, it's time to wire it up and make the magic happen. So you just give it 12 volts and ground on these big ass wires, and then one of the small wires is a switched 12 volt. So I'll just connect that directly to the battery. And I heard a click, so maybe something. And nothing, it's still super hard to turn. It feels the same, huh? I did take this thing apart like I do with basically everything. So there is a non-zero chance that I broke it. Let's double check the wiring. Big wires go to the battery, one small wire to the switch. Oh, I forgot to plug the sensor into the control box. It needs the sensor to know what's going on, of course. It seems so obvious now. And now we'll give it another shot. It feels slightly easier, just a little bit. I can tell when I unplug the ignition wire and turn the controls off. There's no resistance on the output shaft, so it's only seeing the torque it takes to turn the electric motor. But if I put some resistance on the output shaft, Oh, that's awesome. So there are powered racks and there are powered columns, but I have created the world's first powered firewall. It might not be the world's first, but I'm not gonna do the research to find out. In any case, I'm calling it a powered firewall. I'm like 80% sure this is a good idea. I'll need to put a set screw in to give it some extra grip, and I'll probably also need to hold the powered firewall in another spot. I might be able to laser cut something that picks up these holes here in the front and also on the brake master cylinder. With the big steel part in the back, there shouldn't be much load up on the front, but I don't really want to rely on this one press fitting here to keep the motor from rotating. So it needs a little more work. I need to connect the powered firewall to the rack and that should be pretty straightforward. The other thing I need to do is make a mount for the steering wheel and run a shaft from the other side of the powered firewall to the steering wheel. And I also need to buy a steering wheel. I'm leaning towards this one. I like it, looks nice, looks simple. It's kind of like the E-Type wheel, but I'm not a big fan of the circular cutouts on my car. It looks good on the E-Type, but they feel a little too racy for the Mark V. What do you think? Yay, nay, some other wheel? Let me know in the comments. The Tesla swapped Jag is a pretty awesome project, but I have another project I'm going to be starting very soon. It's not usually a great idea to overlap major projects, but I think I'll be fine. In any case, if you want to be one of the first to find out what that project is, hit that subscribe button and then go tell literally everybody you know about Superfast Matt. Wait, wasn't the car on that side last time? <laughs>